Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome once again to the Nanovic Institute's virtual lunch lecture series. My name is Heather Stanfield. I am a postdoctoral research fellow here at the Institute, and my colleagues and I are very pleased to have you all with us in digital fellowship as we continue to explore topics of interest in the contemporary European world. Now, before I get to the exciting business of introducing our wonderful guest this afternoon, let me say a few words about the Zoom webinar format that we are enjoying this afternoon. We do hope that you will feel encouraged to ask questions at the end of the talk. And so in order to do that, your Zoom window has a Q&A box at the bottom on the right hand side for you to just click and ask the question, type it into the box that you see come up when you click that button. You can do this at any point during the talk if you have a question that occurs to you, or you can wait to um, uh, wait until the end when we collect all questions at the same time. If you are a student, we have a student uh, tradition here at the Nanovic Institute where we like to allow a student, an undergraduate student especially, to ask the first question. So if you have a question, especially if you're in Dr. Kettler's class, uh, please write your name and that you are a student when you type your question so that we will know to go ahead and give you priority in asking that question. Now, it is a true pleasure to introduce our speaker this afternoon and friend of the Nanovic Institute, Dr. Timothy Ryback, director and co-founder of the Institute for Historical Justice and Reconciliation at The Hague. The Institute seeks to address the unresolved historical legacies that remain in current and former regions of conflict, not only in Europe, but in Africa and the Middle East, uh, as well as in East Asia. An expert on the legacy of Nazism and a formidable historian in his field, Dr. Ryback has also reached a wider audience as a public intellectual. His work in the areas of memory studies and historical legacies particularly has been widely published in such periodicals as the Atlantic Monthly, the New Yorker, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal, among others. Most recently, very recently, in fact, I think last week, he and his team have just completed a 400 page manuscript about to be printed by the International Bar Association in London entitled Contested Histories in Public Spaces, Principles, Processes, Best Practices. This volume, for which Dr. Ryback served as lead editor, consists in 10 case studies from around the world designed to help policy planners and decision makers who are dealing with disputes over statues, memorials, street names, and other controversial sites of memory. And this topic is especially timely, not only for its clear relevance to ongoing public debates about the role and the fate of statues and monuments in the United States and around the world, but also for us here at the Keough School of Global Affairs and at the Nanovic Institute in particular, for drawing attention to the interplay between humanities and um, policy. So humanities disciplines such as history and the potential of humanities scholars to influence and shape public policy, which is a topic of great interest to us here this year. His talk today will address some of these issues, as well as explore the controversies inherent in the cultural struggle over iconography and memorials, and is entitled Statue Toppling in Europe, Vandalism or Vindication. I'm sure you will all join me in giving a warm digital welcome to Dr. Timothy Ryback. Thank you, Heather, for that kind introduction. Um, and appreciation to the Nanovic Institute of European Studies for inviting me for this virtual lecture. Thank you, Clements. Um, yes, we did just complete this 400 page manuscript today. And what I will tell, especially the undergraduate students, I spent the weekend checking footnotes. So it doesn't matter how long you live, footnotes are always there. Um, yes, today I'll be talking about um, the, a very timely issue from a European perspective. Um, and the title is Statue Toppling, Vandalism or Vindication? Um, Following the tragic death of George Floyd last spring, this issue has come into very sharp relief. Um, we've seen these attacks on statues of Confederate generals, founding fathers, even Christopher Columbus. 
there have been similar actions against statues in Europe, only here we have kings, print statues of kings, queens, princes, and most notably slave traders. Um, like Edward Colston in the port city of Bristol, you see that image of him when he used to be on his pedestal. Um, you certainly saw the footage last spring of him being toppled, dragged through the streets, and then dumped in the harbor. Um, before I get into that, and we will be focusing in particular on that as an act of vindication or vandalism, um, but first, a bit of background on the Contested Histories project that Heather just mentioned. Um, this is a map of contestations that we've been tracking around the world for the last four years. Asia, Africa, Europe, the Americas, if you'll see just added last week, even Greenland, more than 180 to date, suggesting this is a truly global phenomenon. But if you look at the map, um, you'll notice in per a particularly dense cluster in Europe legacies of communism, fascism, imperialism, colonialism, slave trade. Um, we've got a lot of history to digest on this side of the ocean as I'll begin to show you in a minute. Um, but first one issue, you know, what is it that makes statues so contentious? Um, yeah, I would argue they are the most visible manifestation of historical memory. They tell us who is worth remembering, remembering, commemorating, honoring. They also impose on public spaces a collective historical memory and with it, in a sense, a collective identity on a community, um, the politics of memory, as it were, but also the politics of identity. And so it raises these questions, you know, who decides um, which historical events, which historical figures, and in particular, for how long? Who determines when it's time for a statue to go? Um, especially in open democratic societies where rule of law prevails, where change comes at the polling places rather than in the streets, the answer should be fairly clear. Um, but it's become blurred in particular you know, in the last few months, which leads to this question you know, in our talk, statue toppling, vandalism, or vindication. Um, Europe is a good place to look in exploring these things. Europe, Europeans have been scripting and re-scripting their commemorative landscape since ancient times. Um, a lot of history to write in rewrite. Here's an example from Rome, the, what's called the Damnatio Memoria, um, a damnation of memory. This, the Roman Senate would vote an emperor into oblivion if they decided to. The name would be erased from histories, heads would be lopped off of marble statues and replaced, bronzes would be melted down and recast. It's the same with coins. We know of at least 25 cases of emperors that were condemned to oblivion, but in fact, the practice was so effective that it's impossible to ever know the exact number. Um, here we have Emperor Greta, um, even a boyhood image erased from this fresco. Um, keep in mind, there's, this is not an act of vandalism. This was voted by the Senate um, and done you know, in a completely legal manner. As I said, a long history of evolving commemorative landscapes. Um, in Europe, these changes, especially in modern times, have been accompanied by significant social and political upheaval, um, generally with revolutions. Um, this image here is the Place de la Concorde in the center of Paris. Uh, many of you may know, may recognize this site. Um, to the right, you have the Tuileries Gardens and the famous Louvre Museum. 
the Champs Elysees to the left, along with the Arc de Triomphe. So it really is, in a sense, the a very the very heart of Paris, um, the, the heart of the city. This is the same square in the mid 18th century. At that time, it was called Place Louis Cannes. Before the French Revolution, he was the son of Louis XIV, the famous sun king who built Versailles. Louis XV himself was father of Louis XVI, no surprise there, um, who was deposed during the French Revolution. His wife famously said, let them eat cake. If you'll notice in the center of the square um, is a large equestrian statue of Louis XV. Now here's the same square a couple of decades later after the revolution. Now it's the Place de la Révolution, 1789, the French Revolution. You'll note that the plinth is empty where Louis XV had stood. Note also just to the left, there's a guillotine. Hundreds of uh, people were beheaded, including Louis XVI and his wife, Marie Antoinette. This is revolution, not vandalism. It's vindication with a vengeance. Um, and now here is the same square again today, which we just saw, um, with its current name. This is Place de la Concorde, the square of concordance. Um, the obelisk was a gift from Egypt to France in the mid 19th century. It remains a gathering place for Parisians. Um, I remember being there when Nicolas Sarkozy was elected, everyone gathered there. I was there more recently during the protests with the Gilets Jaunes, the yellow vests, when it was again in chaos. Um, I've actually attended a conference a couple of years ago at the Nanovix Institute um, on 1968. And there we also talked about this corner of Paris um, when it was once again in disarray. Um, now, another example of revolution and vindication. Russian Revolution 1917, fury against the czars. Once again, vindication. The imperial family is murdered. Public space is rescripted. St. Petersburg became Petrograd, then Leningrad. St. Petersburg, again today. Um, there was also a significant resignification or reconfiguration of public spaces. Here we see the Kremlin during the Soviet era with the mausoleum to Lenin next to it. So what you have is a Tsarist palace that became the seat of Soviet power. Um, now it's the seat of Russian power where you know, Mr. Putin runs his corner of the world. Um, what we're gonna see now are some statues of Soviet heroes that were erected across the Soviet bloc. Uh, this is a statue of Lenin in Budapest. Um, in, um, before the 1950s or into the 1950s, there was then a movement of de-Stalinization, um, which led to the removal of a lot of statues of Lenin. Here you now see the same statue after de-Stalinization, only his boots are left. Um, after the revolution of, 1890, of 1989, there was a similar purge of Soviet iconography across Eastern Europe and, and the former Soviet Union. This is Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. There were more than 5,000 Lenin statues in the Ukraine alone. Their removal became known as Leninopod, or the toppling of Lenin statues, or Lenin toppling is what it was known as, or is known as still. Um, 
there were statue parks that were created to hold these discarded monuments. There were just vast numbers of them and the dimensions were such. Um, there's a statue park outside of Moscow. There's another one outside of Budapest. Here's one in Lithuania, um, one of the three Baltic states. Um, what's interesting about these statue parks is that they allowed for the removal of these complicated iconographies from the public spaces, but it also allowed them to preserve historical memory. Uh, and this has been a solution that's been pro proposed for the Confederate statues in the United States and is really not a bad idea. I should also mention in other parts of the world, there's a statue park in Taiwan. Um, they've, this has become a, a useful way of, of preserving the memory without, without let's say cluttering the public spaces with uncomfortable legacies, but allowing um, the preservation in a, in a contained site. Which brings us to the present uh, now. Um, since last spring, when George Floyd was killed in Minnesota by you know, the Minneapolis police, um, there, have been a, there have been mass protests across the United States and the toppling of a large number of statues. We've actually seen the same thing happen in Europe. Black, mass protests, Black Lives Matter, and attacks in particular on these iconic statues. Um, here is a statue, this is Leopold II, King of Belgium. And some of you may know, have heard of him. He was responsible for horrific atrocities in the Belgian Congo during the colonial era. This is Jean-Baptiste Colbert on the steps of the Assemblée Nationale in Paris, um, basically the French you know, Congress. Um, Colbert was author of the Code Noir, the Black Code, which essentially legalized the French slave trade and determined exactly how slaves were to be treated. Um, it's, a, it's a horrific, catalog of legal parameters for, for regulating the, the, the slave trade. Um, another attack, Winston Churchill outside the Houses of Parliament in London. As you all know, he was the man who saw Britain through its darkest hours. He helped defeat Nazi Germany, was a great ally of the United States. He was also a colonist and, and a racist. Um, finally, we come to, of course, Edward Colston in Bristol. This is Sunday afternoon, June 7th, shortly after 3 p.m., about two weeks after the killing of George Floyd. Um, there was a Black Lives Matter protest that drew more than 10,000 people. Colston stood in a square on a, this pedestal in a central part of the city for almost a hundred years. He was a 17th century slave trader responsible for the transport of enslaved people from Africa to the Americas by calculations more than 80,000 human beings. He made an absolute fortune he was also a very generous benefactor to Bristol, and he is honored everywhere throughout the city. Street names, statues, schools, a very famous music hall where everyone from the Beatles to U2 have performed. There's even a local pastry in the city called the Colston Bun. Um, now I'd like to share with you However, a brief video from that afternoon. It's a clip, um, 30 seconds long, so you've got to watch closely. It was compiled by The Guardian, which is one of Britain's leading newspapers and captures that afternoon, the afternoon events, I think, very effectively. 
I hope we're getting audio on this. Now, I hope I didn't hear the audio on this. I hope maybe you did. But if you even the images on it, um, I think capture something of the mood of the French and Russian revolutions, even the fall of the Berlin Wall, the, the joy of toppling these statues and you know, doing away with them. This is really an iconic moment, watching the slave trader dumped in the harbor where his ships once set sail from. Um, but this is also fundamentally different from the French and Russian revolutions or even the Berlin Wall. Here we have protesters taking to the streets in an established functioning democracy, voting, legislation, checks and balances, rule of law. Suddenly you have masses of people taking to the streets, destroying public property. This is frequently called vandalism as was actually pointed out the next day. Uh, that Monday, Boris Johnson, the prime minister, condemned the attacks. He said he had sympathy with the strong emotions over the killing of George Floyd, but he said this did not justify public disorder and destruction. I quote, we have a democracy in this country. If you don't like the statues, get yourself elected or elect someone else who will remove them, but do not destroy public property. So the question, is it vandalism or vindication? Interestingly enough, British law is fairly explicit in this regard. Here we have the Criminal Damage Act of 1981. I'll share with you some of the relevant texts. Quote, a person who without lawful excuse destroys or damages any property is guilty of a crime. And the penalty, you'll see there's also punishment for offenses. The penalty is also very clear. Up to 10 years imprisonment for the damage of public properties without, and I love that term, um, without lawful excuse. So what happened? The police launched an investigation. They identified 18 potential suspects. Prosecutors pressed the Bristol Post, the local newspaper, to help identify them. They had the images. They wanted to know who the people were. The editor of the Bristol Post refused to cooperate. Um, I'll be happy to discuss the complex legal issues during the Q&A session, um, but just let me say, at the end of this process, one teenager was given a slap on the hand, an 18-year-old, and that was it. Part of his punishment involved having to attend meetings on statues in Bristol and also make a financial contribution to an anti-racist charity organization. Um, but the question is then, why? Um, you know, why was there not a prosecution? What was going on? Um, and this is where the vindication comes in. And if not vindication, then we'll say at least a recognition of the failure of the democratically elected governments, and this means also local governments, to represent the interests of the people. There were not these were not wanton attacks of destruction. Um, this was a sign of communities that felt marginalized and disenfranchised. 
And this is one of the key findings of these 180 studies that we did. Um, if there's a problem with your statues, there's a problem with your society. It's rarely about the object itself. There are always deeper underlying issues, which I think is suggested by this particular image, um, a surge of power. This statue was put up on the Colston pedestal a month, a month after his toppling. It's a, um, it's a, a resin um, sculpture of a woman named Jen Reed, who is one of the anti-Colston protesters. It was an unofficial installation, what's known as a you know, guerrilla art, what we call a counter monument a statue that rebalances or is intended to rebalance the historical narrative. The city let Jen Reed stand for one day, but then removed her. Um, however, I think this statue captured the moment brilliantly. Um, and where, which leads, uh, which brings us to where we are today um, in Bristol. What's happened is the plinth is still empty. Um, Colston, they pulled him out of the harbor, um, in but preserved him in the damaged condition, which means they left the red and blue graffiti on him, all his bangs and scrapes. Um, and they're planning on putting him in the museum as part of an exhibition not only on the Colston legacy, but also preserving the protests against him and his legacy in the slave trade. Um, there is also talk that the Jen Reed statue will be placed there as well. And I, I do hope that the city makes the decision. Um, but where does that leave us? So vandalism or vindication and how to respond. Uh, protect proper public property and prosecute the protesters. Um, as we've seen, there's nothing immutable about statues. Um, there's a constant process of scripting and rescripting commemorative landscapes going all the way back to Roman times. The problem here is it's a bit like geological time. We don't notice the change on a day-to-day -day basis, uh, even in the United States. New York City was originally New Amsterdam before the British took it from the Dutch. But before that, the Dutch bought it from the Lenape people um, who had called it Manahata, meaning hilly island or the place where they would go for wood for their bows and arrows. So, you know, the, the identity of places changes over time. It's just hard to see on a on a day to day basis, even sometimes on a generational basis. Um, so therefore, it's not so much, and this is our what we are arguing for with our project. It's not so much a matter of preventing change, but rather of managing change in an effective and responsible manner. Ideally, before the statues are toppled or burned or thrown into harbors. It's, um, it's very clear that these disputes over statues and street names and memorials each have their own particular dynamics, their own set of imperatives, whether it's social, political, e some are economic, even aesthetic. Um, but while there are, while every situation is different, there really is only a very limited range of actual remedies for addressing this. Now, here's a chart that um, we've been working to develop with the OSCE over the last couple of years. And the OSCE is the Organization for Security and Cooperation in Europe. It's a 57 member states organization with um, Russia on one end, the United States on the other, and all of Europe in between. And they look to manage relations, as it says, related to 
security and cooperation issues on the basically on the continent of Europe. And one of the issues that they've actually identified as important is this whole is the whole contestation over statues and memorials. Um, the range that we basically identify, and this is a, 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 a spectrum which has much more nuance to it, but this was the basic outline. There is the status quo, which is, you know, you do nothing. Um, and in fact, sometimes if you wait, things just blow over. And it's, sometimes it's useful to wait to see how serious the protests or the objections may be. Then there are additive measures, and this ranges from placarding, putting up a plaque, counter monuments, to relocation. All of this permits a contextualization or even a resignification of the contested objects. Um, the last option really is removal or destruction. We are, as an institute, opposed to this latter solution um, in most cases. In what, for one good reason among many, um, but that not only does it erase history and the ability to elucidate, elucidate it, but it also eliminates a lot of creative possibilities for dealing with a contested object. Let me give one example, actually my favorite example. Um, this is a very Southern part of Europe. Uh, this is on the island of Martinique, which is a department of the French Republic. So it is part of France. Um, it's a, this is a statue of Empress Josephine. Uh, she was Napoleon's first wife. Um, the daughter of a slave-only family on Martinique. She was actually born there. Um, it is said that she was responsible for convincing Napoleon to reintroduce slavery into the French colonies. Uh, the statue was erected in her honor in the 19th century, but in the early 1990s, it was, and I'll say, quote, unquote, vandalized. Um, she was decapitated and splashed with red paint to resemble blood. Here, here she is. Um, now, the French did something interesting. Instead of restoring the statue, you know, repairing the vandalism, they left the monument as it was as a commemoration of the protests against French colonialism and Josephine's particular role in the, in the slave trade. And to my mind, it was, it's a much more effective way of preserving this vi expression of vindication rather than erasing the legacy completely. Um, and I, I actually, they're doing something very similar with the Colston statue. You could have left him at the bottom of the, of the harbor where he probably belongs, but by placing him in the museum, you're going to put him in a new context. And you've basically re-signified a statue that had very offensive connotations, but now it actually preserves part of the history of the reaction to it. Um, which brings us then back to this question, is it, you know, vandalism or vindication? As I say, no, no two cases are alike. Every situation will be different. I think as a French like to say, compliqué, compliqué, it's complicated. But I, in, in closing, to leave time for questions, I'd like to just offer three central issues that I think are important for reflection. Um, and this relates to these broader issues that we've seen. One is that of principal legacy. How does one determine the principal legacy of a historical figure? Christopher Columbus as explorer or genocidus? Robert E. Lee as a brilliant military commander or an upholder of the institution of slavery? Winston Churchill, colonialist or defender of democracy? Um, the second is identity politics, and it has to do with who controls the public spaces, who determines a collective memory, 
Um, what do statues say about us as a community? By their very nature, they are static. They capture a particular moment in time, a particular person, and then they impose this on the public space. And with it, you know, impose a collective understanding of, of, of history. Um, I think a shorthand for reflection on this, that's a catchphrase we use, which is that times change, people change, statues don't, and that's a problem. The third is, brings us back then to va vandalism or the vindication question. And it raises a lot of important issues. How do we balance rule of law with the needs or demands of those seeking justice, equality, recognition? Are there times when quote unquote vandalism is justified? When is process rule of law used to, you, becomes an impediment to progress? Um, whether with state heritage protection laws, which you see in the US are used in a very similar way to memory laws in the former Soviet bloc. Um, in particular, you see legislation being manipulated to political ends, either to preserve or remove a statue. Um, and when they say sort of all politics is local, I think you could say all issues related to statues ultimately come down to local politics. Um, so in closing, I would like to then thank the Nanovic Institute for inviting me um, for this lecture, but also would like to recall an invitation I received a couple of uh, several years ago when I was there for the um, conference on 1968 and was taken to see the murals of Christopher Columbus. At that point, there was some very heated discussion and debate I, I recall on what was being done. I understand the situation has now been resolved. Actually, I don't understand it. I know it for a fact because we've actually included it in one of our 180 case studies. Um, I won't tell you where we came down on this um, yet, but um, I, I'd be very interested in hearing sort of how, what the student reaction was to this particular remedy um, to this particular problem. Um, once again, um, thank you, Heather. Um, thank you, Clements. And thank you to the Nanovic Institute for inviting me um, for this presentation. I might also mention thank you to Connor for helping manage all these slides. Thank you so much, Tim, for a very fascinating uh, and detailed talk with a lot of examples from contemporary events. Um, I'd like to reiterate my earlier call for students in particular to ask a question, but of course the floor is now open to everyone. We'd like to thank Tim again as well for generously agreeing to uh, field questions from the audience. So once again, if you do have a question, uh, you can click on the Q&A button that comes up when you hover on the bottom of the Zoom window on your screen, and you can type your question right into the, the box that comes up there. Uh, and if you're a student, uh, please go ahead. Don't uh, worry about what your question is. If you have a, a question that is remotely relevant, I'm sure Tim will be happy to, to answer it. At the moment, I, I don't see any questions in the Q&A box. Um, so I could use my privilege as moderator to ask a question, Tim, or if you'd like to delve into that, um, those, those comments that you had about the Columbus murals, I'm sure we'd all be, be interested in hearing that as well. Well, I'll be very sure. I, I, I saw the murals. I understood the problems related to them. Um, and reflected on what should be done or what could be done. Um, one concern I had, and as I say, we use the notion of removal um, in worst case scenario, destruction as really the, 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 the last remedy. And ideally one would find other ways of, of dealing with it. 
people have used light installations, they've used counter monuments, they've used narrative plaques. I actually think that um, the, the uh, that solution to this is, is really brilliant. Um, I think you've, um, as I've understood it, they, they, the, the murals are, are currently covered, but that they remain intact as they, as they were. Um, and when an occasion presents itself for trying to contextualize it or understand it, it's there, um, but it's actually been um, removed from, from the, 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 the daily, uh, sort of the daily discourse of, 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 of images and iconography. So I, I think it was a, a, a very wise and very thoughtful resolution to it. Thank you. But I'd be, I don't know how the resonance was at, at, the, at the university in regard to this, but it, it seemed to be a very effective solution. Well, it doesn't look like we have any, any questions at the moment from undergraduates, but we do have some questions coming in from the audience. Um, so let me ask you, there's a question here in particular about um, the differences between how these issues compare in Africa versus Europe and America, particularly relevant to South Africa, where there is a large oppressed majority, but where there's still a lot of the legacy, both in terms of street names and town names. And of course, with the Roads Must Fall campaign, there are other um, physical memorial objects in the landscape that still have resonance with colonialism. What do you think uh, are the specific differences in the African context relative to the European um, or American context? Well, you mentioned the Roads Must Fall movement in Cape Town, South Africa. And what one needs, this took place in March of 2015. Um, and this was in fact the first time an issue of a statue reached, glo brought global attention. And when I say, if you have a problem with your statue, there's, there are deeper problems. Um, in brief, Cecil Rhodes was a colonial era businessman um, and political politician in South Africa. He was also the founder of De Beers Diamonds, made a you know, colossal amount of money, which he then donated to um, Oxford University and created the, you know, the famous Rhodes Fellowships, um, as well as built, rebuilt Oriel College. But there was a large statue of him also on the Cape Town campus because he had donated the land for it. The students had been protesting more. It was related to the treatment of Black South Africans on campus um, in regard to tuition fees, in regard to housing, in regard to the curriculum. And they could not get the university administration's attention. And so they turned it to the Rhodes statue, um, which in some ways uh, you know, brought everything together and woke the university up to this as a problem. They're now going through a much deeper and more thoughtful process of transformation. But more importantly, I think it was you know, that, that moment, this is March and early April 2015, was the first time a contestation over a statue reached international proportions. You will remember that there was this horrific shooting in Charleston in June of that year, which then led to all of the issues related to Confederate statues in the United States. But if you, you, know, you look at the situation before spring 2015, um, most people were not having a lot of problems with, with their statues. There's a question from a student in Dr. Kettler's class, uh, so you won't see him uh, on the list here, but he uh, would like to know, this is from Joey, what is your personal opinion on the Christopher Columbus statue's legacy in the United States? Do you feel, given your expertise, that the removal of these particular statues fits into the category of vandalism or vindication? It depends. <laughs> um, 
You know, the Columbus one is interesting. We, uh, you know, he has been brought into this debate and I think it surprised people because there was a whole issue around the, the Confederate statues, but Columbus um, came into it um, very much the same time. And the, you know, the question is, Columbus as explorer or genocidist? Uh, I think depending on the context and the situation, um, I understand the desire for these attacks on, on, on the statues. I will give, um, I, how, how should I say this? Um, I guess the, there's a really good example in Buenos Aires um, where there was an enormous statue put outside of the presidential palace. It'd been there for a hundred years. And this was raised as a question in 2007 or 2008. Why do we have a statue of a genocidist standing outside of the presidential palace? There was a huge debate in the country over it because there was a large Italian immigrant community there where he was a real identity figure and a strong European orientation. So Columbus brought that type of, uh, he was an identity figure for a lot of Argentinians. Um, instead of tearing him down, what they did, they removed him from the presidential palace and they went and put him on the harbor looking back out to sea to say he was basically a navigator, to turn him back into a navigator rather than an explorer. And in his place, they put it in a, a large statue of a 19th century um, indigenous um, guerrilla fighter who was a, a woman. And so it was a, it was a real iconic, you know, icon, iconic shift from an orientation of how the country viewed itself from, from the center of the capital. Um, one, one of the issues, and you know, this issue of, of statues being immutable, and in Columbus in particular, what I, I would like to recall is that Columbus, when these statues of Christopher Columbus went up in the late 19th century, it was a way of making Italian immigrants feel part of America. Before that time, there had been a couple of statues of Columbus, but this proliferation was there to say to Italians who were ostracized to say, you are part of America. Um, one additional element is that I learned actually at Notre Dame when I was there, I said, why does Notre Dame have a statue of Christopher Columbus? You're you're, 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 you're landlocked and are not a statue, but these, these murals of Christopher Columbus. And this was explaining, which I found wonderful. I said, you know, Catholics in the 19th century, there was a lot of prejudice against them. And Columbus was Italian, but he was also Roman Catholic. And as an identity figure, it allowed us to say, um, the Protestants may have settled America, but it was the Catholics who founded it. And so, you know, the, the role of a statue in identity politics, but also how that changes over time. Um, so I think the Columbus statues in the late 19th century were very important for making different groups of people feel a part of the American experience, building them into it. Um, that maybe the time has come to change, maybe relocate some, maybe you know, recontextualize them, and you know possibly you know we've some of them need to be I don't know if they need to be toppled and burned, but maybe some should do need to be removed. So I think it's all very context specific. Thank you. I'd love to follow up on that, but we are getting a lot of questions coming in now. I'm very pleased to inform you. And so let's shift back to Europe. And specifically, this is a great question about the non-debate about statues that's happening in Germany. So could you speak a bit about the situation in Germany? Do you feel, our, our question asker feels that uh, Germany hasn't 
really caught up with other countries in terms of its response to statues, would we expect that the Germans would have a particularly fervent response to statues and memorials given its history in the 20th century? Or do you in fact think that their response is uh, different in a, another way uh, and that maybe rather than not responding, they are responding, but just in a way that is that doesn't fit quite along this, the same spectrum? I would, I guess what I would say about the Germans, what the French would say, compliqué, compliqué. Um, I think the German, you know, the German commemorative landscape is colossally complicated. I mean, you look at the legacy of national socialism and what to do with all of these monuments. It's easy to remove the statues of Adolf Hitler and to rename the Herbann Göring plots back to what it was before that time. But um, you then had the overlay of the communist experience in East Germany. Um, and there you saw politics playing a very interesting role because you had two of the major concentration camps were Buchenwald and Dachau. And when you would go to those, this was before the wall came down, if you went to the Buchenwald camp, they would talk about the persecution of the communists in the camp with almost no reference to the Jewish experience or the Holocaust. When you went to Dachau, there would be talk about the Jewish experience in the Holocaust, but hardly any mention of the communists who were actually the first victims in the camp. So there's been a politicization in Germany of historical memory. But I would say they've, they've done a fairly good job with cleansing their landscape of, of the most offensive, finding ways of dealing with some of the more complicated objects. And to, to close this off, I think the Germans created one of the most effective forms of commemoration that we've seen anywhere. And these are called Stolpersteine or stumbling stones. And these are little brass plaques that are placed in front of the homes where Jewish people had lived. Now students in school kids do research about their hometowns. They learn about Jewish families who were there. And then these plaques are placed on the ground. It is, there are more than 70,000 of them now. It is considered the largest public memorial in the world, but it integrates these, this historic memory into the daily life because you see these stones glint and they're there. Um, and yet life goes on and yet it's a presence. In terms of the broader issue of the, of the protests, I don't think you have the same social dynamics in England or France that you have in Germany. So no, there were not large Black Lives Matter protests there. Um, but I think it's Germans have a different history and a different relationship. We have a question now about religious disputes and iconoclasm. Would you say that, hang on, I've lost the question. Would you say that disputes over statues of politicians and generals also have a religious dimension signifying changes in civil religions? And does casting these as religious issues help us to understand the depth of feeling about them? What I will say is we, with our project, the issue of religion is so complicated. P political and historical figures are complicated enough. Um, and we've, we've actually have not, we've, we've kept that aside. We have not gone into issues of religious iconography in public spaces because it is so complicated and so nuanced. With that said, there is one clear example, and that is of Franco, you know, the um, Franco, the dictator, the fascist dictator, was buried in a cathedral outside of Madrid. And it was a hugely complicated issue because it had become a place of pilgrimage, not only for Roman Catholics, but also for fascists. 
And this, the country went through a multi-year debate over this and what ultimately has been done the, um, and because it was also this, this connection between a very complicated history and, and religion. And Franco was disinterred just last year and reburied in a, in a less obvious place. Um, but remains a, it remains a, a very, very complicated site. And this is what we call actually is relates to necropolitics, which is a whole nother area unto itself. We have another student question. It's a student who would like to know if there was a lull in statue toppling between the Roman Republic and the 20th century, and has the current surge of statue toppling been a novel occurrence? I'm sure you have lots to say. What's interesting about this is um, there wasn't as much uh, statue toppling because there weren't as many statues. Um, this notion of recognizing historic figures with these, with these large statues only emerged in the late 18th and into the 19th century. The Victorian era saw a proliferation of these statues even in the United States, as you probably followed with the, you know, with the Confederate statues, they were a late 19th century, early 20th century development. So your, your statue toppling is in relative terms, a, a modern development or a more recent development in the ancient world, very much so because statues were such a part of the identity. Um, but I think, um, it's this, what we are seeing as statue toppling nowadays is really in the, well, really since the French Revolution um, has become a sort of a, a practice in the world. I think we have time for one more question. I'd like to thank you very much for your time. And so this question will be about looking toward the future. As we look to the future of public memorialization in response to contemporary events, that is memorials that will be built moving forward, one of our audience members would like to know, do you think we will see a decline in statues as the chosen medium to use as a site of memory? And if so, how might memorialization in the future look? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I actually think that you, you will, I think what we've seen is in fact how important statues are. So I don't think this is the end of statues. I think this is a new era in which we've woken up to looking at statues and understanding them in public spaces. What I do think you're going to, what you're going to see coming out of the, the, the debates over the Confederate statues and especially in the wake of the tragic death of, of George Floyd, this, this, the, this, Re this understanding of how statues need to change and the commemorative landscapes need to change. And I actually think you're gonna be seeing more innovative statues, more inclusive types of statues. You know, someone has asked, why do we need to have statues of mostly men, but even women? Why can't you have statues that actually reflect something more abstract? Um, and to capture a, a much more um, diverse society and, and in objects that will not be focus of, of contention, but rather ways of, of, of bringing people together. Oh, and, I, and maybe in, in concluding there very quickly, Australia did it brilliantly. There was a, um, a contestation over James Cook who was the Christopher Columbus of Australia, very contentious with the indigenous populations. What they allowed the indigenous community to do was to build a counter installation to this. Um, and it was, it's a brilliant and beautiful installation that in some ways detoxifies the James Cook statue and really creates a, 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 an incredible preserving an, an incredible moment. Um, so I think with, um, I think we've been hypersensitized to issues related to statues. And I actually think this has been a good learning experience for communities. Um, and I actually think we're going to see a much more 
innovative, much more creative approach to our public spaces. Well, Tim, thank you so much for your time this afternoon, for your generosity in answering questions and for joining us with the Nanovic virtual lunchtime lectures. I'd like to thank you all for joining us as well and remind you to stay tuned to nanovic.nd.edu for information about our future lunchtime lectures. We have Professor Ingrid Rowland coming up on Thursday, the 6th of October, which is next on the slate, as long as as well as a number of other exciting Nanovic events. Um, so thank you very much and have a great afternoon. Okay. Thank you for inviting me.